morning. It's a great morning, isn't it? Yeah. Well, let me start with this. Each of us has a unique testimony as to how we came into God's kingdom. But the truths that guide us in are the same. Here's a wonderful story of the salvation of a man on his way home, okay? Imagine that. God can save somebody on their way home. Here's how the account reads. As for Philip, an angel of the Lord said to him, go over to the road that runs from Jerusalem through the Gaza desert, arriving around noon. So he did. And who should be coming down the road but the treasurer of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, the queen. He had gone to Jerusalem to worship and was now returning in his chariot, reading aloud from the book of the prophet Isaiah. The Holy Spirit said to Philip, go over and walk along beside the chariot. Philip ran over and heard what he was reading and asked, do you understand it? Of course not, the man replied. How can I when there is no one to instruct me? And he begged Philip to come up into the chariot and sit with him. The passage of scripture he had been reading from was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb is silent before the shearers, so he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. And who can express the wickedness of the people of his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, was Isaiah talking about himself or someone else? So Philip began with this same scripture and then used many others to tell him about Jesus. As they rode along, they came to a small body of water and the eunuch said, look, water, why can't I be baptized? You can, Philip answered, if you believe with all your heart. And the eunuch replied, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He stopped the chariot, and they went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, and the eunuch never saw him again, but went on his way rejoicing. The Spirit of God knows who he has prepared to receive the gospel. Would we agree with that? The Spirit of God knows. And he uses human messengers to be involved in sharing the gospel just like this. Would you agree with that? And somehow it works perfectly. Aren't we blessed to be involved in something like this? Charlie, I'm going to ask if you would lead us in prayer to begin the service. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful for your will. We're thankful to God for your love. And you can show that love in many ways. And one is to God for uh, telling us to assemble together for God and fellow worshipers. And we thank you to God for each one here. And this morning as we're assembled, it's great we greet one another and enjoy it. But we know the main purpose for God is to come and listen to your word as your servant puts it out and help us to understand it, not leave it here, but take it with us. Lord, we pray that you can bless our uh, time together here this morning. We thank you for this. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Charlie. So go ahead and open your hymnal to number 521. Okay, number 521. When you find your place, join me in standing. Number 521. And then we're going to sing the whole song. It's only three verses.
fits me. Okay, announcements. If you got your prayer list and you turn it over, you'll see the announcements. And right at the very top is Denise Madison's name. She's got a birthday this week. Huh? And you get to celebrate all week long. Right? Dwayne knows that, right? She gets to celebrate all week long. If she wants to. Well, happy birthday, Denise. All right. And then next, right next to that on the announcement, is a special offering for Greg and Debbie Davis next Sunday. Okay? Now, let me read you some things that just came in the mail that I'd like to share with you. This comes from the president of Wycliffe Bible Translators. He writes, Dear Rockland Baptist Church, I'm writing to let you know that Greg and Debbie Davis have now retired from Wycliffe Bible Translators Incorporated after 35 years of successful ministry, effective on September 30th. On behalf of all Greg and Debbie's colleagues in Wycliffe, I express my deepest gratitude for your prayers, financial investments, and encouragement for them through the years. Your partnership has been a vital part of their successful ministry. We thank God for how he has used Greg and Debbie and for their faithful commitment to the task of Bible translation. Greg and Debbie, along with their three small children, first served with Wycliffe in Suriname, South America. Greg worked as the maintenance supervisor. Debbie was a bookkeeper. They transitioned to Cameroon, Africa, 10 years later, working in similar roles. When their children graduated from high school, the Davises relocated to the U.S. and served at JARS in Waxhaw, North Carolina. Greg managed the auto shop and worked in facilities maintenance. Debbie once again served in bookkeeping and keyboarding Old Testament transaction helps. In their retirement, the Davises look forward to volunteering with Wycliffe and the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association as God and health might allow. Please join us in prayer for Greg and Debbie as they make this major life and ministry transition. Thank you again for the significant role you've played in making their ministry possible and for your part in providing God's word to all people. Unto all the nations worship Dr. John Chesna. Okay? And then I have this note from Greg and Debbie. Let me read this to you. Dear Pastor Darren and all our friends at Rockland Baptist Church, this little booklet, there's a little booklet back there next to a card for them that they're referring to so you can look at that at your convenience. This little booklet encapsulates the vision and the work that God has called us to. Oh, that all people would have access to the Word of God in a language they can actually understand. Your partnership has been helping to make this vision a reality. May God bless you, Greg and Debbie Davis. And then, included here is a certificate of appreciation. This certificate is presented with great appreciation to Rockland Baptist Church for their dedication to the task of Bible translation for 34 years. Signed, Greg and Debbie Wycliffe, September 30th, 2024. That's pretty cool, isn't it? get a certificate like that okay so now what we'd like to do is a special offering in honor of their retirement okay so next Sunday we'll have a plate up there or you can put it in the plates here designated for them okay just as a gift and out an ongoing gift and thanks for all their service and then there's also a card, some of you have already found it, but there's a retirement card back there on the baptistry table to sign, okay? And then here's the interesting thing is they're gonna be in October in this area doing some visits and things like that. So what I'll attempt to do is take the gift and the card and give it to them, okay? While they're in the area during the month of October. And so that will conclude our agreement and supporting them and everything when this month is over. But what a blessing it's been to be involved in their ministry. So pray about what the Lord would have you to bring next week and as a gift. And then uh, the Israel story, we're down to this Sunday night and next Sunday night, and we'll be concluding that 
a journey. And so again, 4.30 p.m. Candy is coming in and we appreciate all the candy efforts that you're doing and it's finding its way back to the pew in the back here. And so thank you for that. And then Wendy Atkins sent another update just recently, a day, I think it was yesterday, and asking for prayer for the workshop that's going on right now for all the participants and the facilitators that you would be in prayer for everybody to be drawn closer to the Lord through this workshop. So I think that's all the information I have. So let's pray for Wendy and the other things. Father in heaven, we thank you for your presence here with us. We thank you, Lord, for, again, Denise celebrating a birthday this week. We pray that she'll have a wonderful week ahead of her. We also, Lord, think of the Davis, Greg and Debbie Davis family, and we're so thankful for the 34 years of time spent in supporting them from the congregation here, for the very kind gesture and the certificate they sent us to be on display. And the other things that we've received, we pray right now that you'll be with Greg and Debbie as they are planning to come up into the area in the month of October to visit some other supporters as probably their farewell. And so we would pray that you'd be with them in that effort. We pray now as they transition into retirement that you'll give them good health and the ability to continue serving you in whatever way that they can see fit to do that. And then, Father, we pray for Wendy Atkins, the request she's given to us from Africa. We pray for the workshops going on, that you'll continue to work in the midst there among the participants and the facilitators, that everybody will be drawn closer to Jesus Christ through this effort. Thank you for what you're going to accomplish. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, for our greeting hymn, we're going to go to number 522. <coughs> That comes right after 521. Makes it easy to find. Okay, 522. And we're just going to sing through the whole thing, the whole song. Okay, so 522, when you find it, join me in standing.
translated as welcome, is defined as making a commitment to live in that truth. It's the same thought as making a promise or taking a vow. We might call this a profession of faith in Christ. Now, here's a troubling question. Is a profession of faith in Christ alone enough evidence to assure us that we are in faith? Don't answer out loud. Think about it for a second. Now, here are some thoughts on this question, beginning with the Lord Jesus Christ. Here's how he answers that question. He said, here is the explanation of the story I told about the farmer planting grain. The shallow, rocky soil represents the heart of a man who hears the message and receives it with real joy, but he doesn't have much depth in his life. And the seeds don't root very deeply. And after a while, when trouble comes, or persecution begins because of his beliefs, his enthusiasm fades, and he drops out. It's easy to be deceived by those who profess one thing and then disappear when they begin to encounter trouble. Here's another reply to that question I asked. John the Apostle comments, Dear children, this world's last hour has come. You have heard about the Antichrist who is coming, the one who is against Christ. And already many such persons have appeared. This makes us all the more certain that the end of the world is near. These against Christ people used to be members of our churches. Does that surprise us? People now against Christ used to be members of our churches. But they never really belonged with us. Or else they would have stayed. When they left us, it proved that they were not of us at all. Those who quit proved they had no root of salvation inside of them. If you have the root, then you don't quit on God. Would you agree with that? You don't quit on God. You see, our initial response to God's word grows, not disappears, in our future responses to God's word. How? For example, no matter who is the Bible teacher, no matter who they are, if they are communicating the truth of the Bible, then we will listen intently and we will try to apply that truth to our lives. In areas of our lives where we have shortcomings, then we are led by God's word to change. Okay? In areas of obedience to God's word, then we will seek to strengthen those things. The apostle states that the word of God is effectively at work in those who believe. Now again, what does that mean? I'm going to borrow a slogan from a modern advertisement about shampoo seen on TV involving two football personalities. Maybe you know who those personalities are. The one has really long hair and he's either Samoan or Hawaiian. Okay. And what's the theme of their advertisement about the shampoo? Here it is. It never stops working. Maybe you've seen it. It never stops working. The reality of our faith is that the Word of God never stops working in us who have believed. Every time the Word of God is presented, we find a great temptation by the public to check out spiritually and mentally. And you might say, 
Well, how do they do that? Many do this by sleeping or simply thinking, well, this doesn't apply to me, so I don't need to listen. Turn the ears off. And these reactions are patterns of unbelief in unbelievers when they are presented with the Word of God. So when you look around and you see somebody during the Word of God taking a nap or not listening, clue, 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 what is that saying about their faith? It's non existent. What pattern is evident in us from the first time we heard the truth until today? What is the pattern that we have watched established? Is the truth still at work in us, or has it ceased to have any influence whatsoever over us? It is at work in us if we are in the faith. It never stops. So what I might be saying is, the evidence is this. We are growing in the faith, not shrinking, right? And every time the Word of God comes across our path, or we hear it, or we watch it, that is a time to grow, right? I'm going to grow from what I get out of God's Word every time. That's good evidence that you're in the faith. You're not out of the faith. Let's look at a second point. Let's go to verse 14. He writes, For you, brethren, became imitators of the churches of God, which are in Judea, in Christ Jesus. This second part of evidence for faith in Christ is our lives. It's our lives. You see, our initial response to Christ is accompanied by living for Him, not ourselves. Uh, what kind of living are we talking about? Paul said these young followers of Christ showed the same Christ-like traits as their older brothers and older sisters living in Judea near Jerusalem. Same traits. Now, what traits did those earlier followers of Christ show? Here's the report given by Luke. Listen. Then Peter preached a long sermon telling about Jesus and strongly urging all his listeners to save themselves from the evils of their nation. And those who believed Peter were baptized, about 3,000 in all. They joined with the other believers in regular attendance at the apostles' teaching sessions and at the communion services and prayer meetings. A deep sense of awe was on them all, and the apostles did many miracles. And all the believers met together constantly and shared everything with each other, selling their possessions and dividing with those in need. They worshiped together regularly at the temple each day, met in small groups in homes for communion, and shared their meals with great joy and thankfulness, praising God. The whole city was favorable to them, and each day God added to them all who are being saved. So let's get this straight from the report. They didn't hesitate getting baptized as an expression of their faith. That, that's the first thing I noticed. And we call that the first step of identification to Jesus. Hey, you want to know who I am? I'm getting baptized to show you I belong to Jesus. They continued to grow and learn all they could about their new faith. They didn't abandon meeting together with their brothers and sisters in Christ. They gave of themselves and their resources sacrificially to help others. They shared each other's burdens. They worshiped God together and on their own. They lived thankfully and served God openly. They had a respected reputation among the lost people. Now, what can we conclude about all this information? Salvation 
is meant to bring wholesale change to every part of our lives. That's it. If we are resistant to live for Christ, then this is a problem of the deepest kind pointing to what? A questionable birth. There's no middle ground in living for Christ as we might say a part-timer or even not at all. Here is our Lord's statement on this issue. Okay, This is what he said. So why do you call me Lord when you won't obey me? But all those who come and listen and obey me are like a man who built a house on a strong foundation laid upon the underlying rock. When the floodwaters rise and break against the house, it stands firm, for it is strongly built. Now, what are the floodwaters which Jesus speaks of? Well, these are the tides of opposition. These are the tides of persecution. These are the tides of troubles in our lives, which can easily crush the unprepared individuals. These are the things which chase away those who falsely proclaim to believe, but wouldn't commit themselves for life. You see, we must come his way and we must live his way or we won't survive like those who don't believe here's another statement of our Lord about this issue of living for him in the future time of trouble and he says very simply sin will be rampant everywhere and will cool the love of many. You see, sin has that effect. It drives love out. If I am living sinfully for myself, then there cannot be love for Jesus in my heart. It's that simple. Because if I love Jesus, then I can't live sinfully. And if I live sinfully, I can't love Jesus. There's no middle ground. And then he goes on to say, but those enduring to the end shall be saved. Faithful living for Christ involves, and here's the word, sacrifice. Sacrifice. Now, I'm going to pick out an example here in the congregation of two people. So everybody's got their seatbelt on because they don't want to be called on. Okay? So you probably won't be called on, so you're safe. Here's the two people I'm going to mention. Charlie and Emily James have been married for a minimum of 70 years or more. Did I get that right? 72 of that is. 72, I stand correct. All right? And there's one thing I know about them, okay, that I don't think I'll get this wrong. But throughout that time, Jesus has been included in their lives every day. I get that right? Okay, they're both looking at me in agree. Okay? And this has guided them into many of the traits that we read about Luke reporting about those early believers. The long list I gave you. That has led to them having many of those traits in their lives, too. That's evidence. You see? It's our lives. We're looking at our lives for evidence that we're in the faith. Well, that's it. That's the evidence. Those traits that we saw, that those early believers had, that's evidence. 
Jesus is there. So we have to come back and ask this question. How do we live daily when it comes to imitating Jesus as our Lord and Savior? Okay? We live as Christians. And what does that mean? Okay, you ready for this? The term actually means little Christ. When we're called Christians, we're saying we are little Jesuses walking around on this earth. That's who we are. We give ourselves sacrificially to do God's will every day of our lives. So when you look at yourself and you go, am I doing that? And the answer is yes. It's like, then you're probably right in the faith where you need to be. Isn't that good to have evidence like this? So you can always go back and look at it and go, what is the evidence? It's this and this. Okay, am I checking this box? Am I checking that box? Okay, let's go to the third one. The last one. Okay, let's pick up at verse 14 where we left off. And let's go through verse 16. For you also suffered the same things from your own countrymen, just as they did from the Judeans, who killed both the Lord Jesus and their own prophets and have persecuted us. And they do not please God and are contrary to all men, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they may be saved, so as always to fill up the measure of their sins. But wrath has come upon them to the uttermost. All right. These young followers of Jesus in Thessalonica are under attack by Jews and Gentiles in their own city. The Jewish followers of Christ living in Judea had been under attack for a long time by their countrymen as of this writing. Attacks upon those in Christ can come from some unusual places or from familiar places involving people we would never think of ever acting this way. The Jewish opposition, okay, carried the beloved title of being God's chosen people. And the bearers of God's word. <coughs> but they had become vicious in their attacks on their own country. These were very religious people acting in a very uncharacteristic way. Even stranger still is they always seem to attack the ones bringing the truth from God that they're waiting to hear and need it so desperately. Isn't that amazing? Every time. And Paul here reports they had a hand in the death of Jesus and in the death of the prophets which preceded him in physical time. And now they persecute those who follow Jesus. And our Lord said, they think they are pleasing God by these actions. But they aren't. They are so determined in their opposition that they will do everything to stop the spread of the truth to many. And therefore their sins are overflowing and earning for them the wrath of God in full measure. That previous generation, according to Jesus, is carrying on the sins of their ancestors right to the end of their existence as described as follows. Jesus said, when he walked on the earth, speaking to his own people, your enemies will pile up earth against your walls and encircle you and close in on you and crush you to the ground and your children within you. Your enemies will not leave one stone upon another. For you have rejected the opportunity that God offered you. In 70 AD, the city of Jerusalem was leveled with one million Jewish people dying. What do we make of this opposition to Jesus in us? And this opposition to living for Jesus? What do we make of it? 
Well, here's the answer of our Lord. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. If I understand this right, we belong to a unique group of servants who endured much and were greatly rewarded for it. The Apostle Peter gives us an answer for the here and now to think of. Here's what he said. Don't be bewildered or surprised when you go through the fiery trials ahead, for this is no strange, unusual thing that is going to happen to you. Instead, be really glad, because these trials will make you partners with Christ in his suffering. And afterwards, you will have the wonderful joy of sharing his glory in that coming day when it will be displayed. Be happy if you are cursed and insulted for being a Christian. For when that happens, the Spirit of God will come upon you with great glory. Maybe like Stephen, when he was in court, falsely accused, and he would be killed. And it says that right there in that moment, in that courtroom, with the whole room filled with accusers, they looked upon Stephen, and they said, and his face shined like the face of an angel. You see, that's, that's the Spirit of God showing up right in the moment to make us know we do we are right where we need to be. These negative things are great assurances that we belong to Jesus or we wouldn't be facing trouble like this. Paul wrote in another letter, for unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. There it is. That's evidence. Hey, got any negative comments against you about believing in Jesus and other things? You know what Jesus and the others are telling us? Oh, that's good. That's good. That's happening to you? Oh, that's good. That's really good. When we get to endure negative reactions to our faith in Christ and in living for Christ, we're in good company. We wouldn't be facing this without Jesus being present here in us. Difficulties and opposition come because we belong to Jesus. That's evidence. Let's remember what these marks of evidence for our faith in Christ are once more. Okay, let me just repeat. Our initial response to the truth and our continuing response to the truth grows. Grows what? Our commitment to who? To Jesus. Every time. Every time what? We hear the truth. Every time we hear the Bible. Every time we read the Bible. Something's happening to us on the inside to make our commitment to Jesus bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Our lives are not our own. So we do the best we can in living sacrificially for Jesus. How often? Daily. Daily. And then last, when we experience negative reactions to our faith in Christ and in living for Him, then we don't let this stop us. We just simply endure it. 
So, if I would simplify this, I could simply say three things to you. Hey, we are growing, we are sacrificing, and we are enduring. Is that the evidence in your life? You say yes, and yes, and yes. Good news. You're in Christ. My hope is that all of us, when we think about these things, it will affirm us that we know this is to be true. This is true about me, about you. This is it. This is true. But if there is any question, about this being true about us, then this is the time to address it with the Lord. And we are here to help in any way that the Lord will allow us to help. And here's the reality. If I am here and this isn't true about me, which puts in doubt my faith in Christ, I would not leave here today until I had this cleared up in my life. So I could leave here with peace of mind. I am in Christ. See? The Word of God is doing what it's supposed to do. Praise God for that, right? Let's bow our heads for prayer. <laughs> Father in heaven, as we come before you right now, we, we take great comfort and hope in the truth. Every time we get to read it, Every time we get to hear it proclaimed, every time we get to study it, every time it's taught, this is a great opportunity for, for us to grow from what we're hearing. It's also a great opportunity to instill in our lives what we should be doing. And it also reminds us that the road ahead is not going to be easy. The road ahead in Christ is going to be challenging, difficult. And so, Father, we come before you right now just thanking you for what we've received today. We understand and realize that it's, it's serving a beneficial purpose in our lives. We do love you. We love the Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, and for what he accomplished for us that we might have eternal life. And I would pray for anybody in our midst that maybe is missing this evidence in their life that they would be encouraged and motivated to do whatever it takes to get this settled before they would leave here today. Thank you for hearing our prayers. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, and then we're going to sing our last hymn. And it's right inside the front cover, right inside the front cover of your hymnal. And it's called, Is My Name Written There? Okay? Is My Name Written There? We're going to sing that whole song. So when you open your front cover and you find it, join me in standing.
and sent to go forth to our neighbor and preach the gospel to them that they may be saved also. And we thank you for your message. We come to you on behalf of your Israelites. We ask you to bless them. Lift them up spiritually, Lord. Be with them. Fight your battles for them. Destroy the enemy. We also ask you, Lord, to be with President uh, Biden and uh, Vice President Harris, Lord. Lift them up spiritually. Bless them. Touch their lives, Lord. Open up their hearts that they will repent of their sins and come to you and ask you to be their Lord and Savior. And we thank you for that. Protect President Trump, Lord God. Lift him up spiritually also and help him with the wisdom of you, Lord, he made uh, defeat his enemies also. And we thank you for that. We thank you for this beautiful day. I ask you, Lord, to bless each and every one. Lift them up spiritually. Fill them with your love and compassion that they too may share with us. We thank you, Lord, in your name. Amen.